Right. So refraction, if you've got some sort of surface between two different materials, usually air and something else, but it doesn't have to be. A uh, classic example, let's say you've got air and water. So maybe you've got a, a lake and then you've got air above it. So water below, air above. And you've got a ray of light coming in through the air approaching the water. So this ray of light is coming in in a straight line. And we typically call this the incident ray. The, the ray coming towards the surface is the incident ray. And what would you expect that ray of light to do when it hits the surface? Refract? Yeah, it's going to refract, or at least some of it's going to refract. Refracting in the sense of going through, but also bending as it goes through. But typically, we would only expect part of the energy going through to go through. Some of the energy is going to do what instead? Reflect? Yeah. Typically, if you've got a ray of light coming in towards the surface, we usually expect some of it to go through and some of it to bounce off. So the beam is going to split. Some of it reflects. And what should we assume about the direction of the reflected ray? It's the same angle as the incident ray. Yeah, the reflected ray is the same angle as the incident ray because it's in the same material. We usually only expect a change in direction or change in the angle if there's a change in medium. The incident ray starts in air, the reflected ray is still in air. There's been no change. And we typically measure the angle by default from the normal. So at the location where the ray hits the surface, you would draw in a no normal line, normal in the sense of perpendicular. <clears throat> and the angle we're talking about is the angle between the ray and the normal line. So let's call this theta one. The reflected ray is just going to be at another copy of theta one, exact same angle. But the reflected ray is going to bend. And to figure out how it bends, I usually draw it out as, imagine this ray of light just kept going in a straight line, no bend. That's what it would do if there was no, if there was no change in material, if the second material was exactly the same as the first material. But instead of going in a straight line, it's going to bend. And one way of figuring out which direction it's going to bend is to look at the speeds. If you compare air versus water, which one allows light to travel faster? Air, air. Yeah. Light travels faster in air. So air corresponds to fast light. And water causes light to go slower. So water is a slower light material. It's still ludicrously fast. It's still going at like a couple hundred thousand meters every, or a couple hundred million meters every second. But it's slower than it goes in air or in a vacuum. So if we're going from fast to slow, we've got a decrease in speed of light. So we also get a decrease in the angle. We're going to, we, we have light traveling slower, so that means the angle is going to decrease. Instead of making the same angle as it did before, it's going to make a smaller angle. The ray of light is going to bend to make the angle somewhat smaller. And we would usually describe this as the ray of light bends towards the normal line, bending to make the angle smaller. So this would be the refracted ray. Closer to the normal line, making a smaller angle as compared to the original ray. And it's also probably going to be somewhat dimmer in terms of the brightness because some of the light gets through, some of the light bounces off, so the beam splits. Any questions on that so far? So this, you said that it bends towards the normal because that you're going from a fast medium to a slow medium? Yeah, it's going from fast light medium to a slow light medium. The speed has decreased, so the angle also decreases. If we were going the other direction, if the, ang if the speed increases, then the angle would also increase. It would bend away from the normal. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions on that setup so far? <clears throat> and then these are tied together by Snell's law. 
the equation describing how these angles are related. That the index of refraction of the first material times sine of the angle it makes in that first material has to equal index of refraction for the second material, in this case water, times the sine of the angle it makes in that material. And how do we define index of refraction here? What does n actually mean? Like when we say the n value is 1.5 or something. Is it the speed of light divided by the velocity um, in that specific medium we're looking at? Yeah, speed of light, specifically speed of light in a vacuum, which is about 300 million meters per second divided by speed of light in that, in that material, in that medium. So the speed light would travel if it were in pure vacuum, divided by the speed that light travels in that material. It's essentially a measure of how much light slows down in that material. If uh, N is very large, a large N value means V in that material is very small. Whereas if n is very small, that means speed of light in that material is very fast. Of course, this can't be more, this can't be less than one because speed of light in that material cannot be faster than speed of light in the vacuum. So the lowest n can possibly be as one. We usually assume that in air, n is approximately one. It's actually very slightly higher than one uh, because light does slow down light a little bit or air does slow down light a little bit but it's pretty close to one. And then water, it's more like, I think 1.33-ish or 1.5, I forget which one it is, but it's somewhat higher than one. So a slower, material, slower light material means a higher N value. So if you know the N values, you can just plug those in, plug in one of the angles and solve for the other angle. Or alternatively, if you're dealing with a material where you don't know the end value, you can do an experiment where you shine light into it, measure both angles, fill those angles in, and then solve for the unknown end value. So this is sometimes a useful way for getting more information about a mysterious unknown material. If you've got some block of a transparent substance, you can send in a ray of light through it, measure how much it bends, calculate the end value and compare that to a table of end values of known materials and figure out maybe this is some specific type of material. V in green, yeah, V is the speed of light in that medium. So for instance, if N in some material is let's say 1.5, that means that the ratio of speed of light in a vacuum divided by speed of light in that material is 1.5 three halves. In other words, the light in that material travels two thirds of 300 million meters per second. Any other questions on that so far? So a typical example of this might be maybe you know this, the angle at which a ray of light is coming in and you want to figure out what angle does it leave at. In that case, if you know the starting angle and both indices of refraction, which you would typically look up on a data table of values for those materials, then you can just fill in Snell's law and solve for the missing angle using inverse sine. And typically if you're dealing with a more complicated setup, like let's say you've got light bouncing around through a prism, you would typically use Snell's law to figure out how the angle changes when you're transitioning from one medium to another. But also if you've just got light traveling within one medium, let's say just light traveling through glass, what path would you assume light travels if it doesn't go through any changes in material? Straight. What was that? Straight. Yeah, it should just go in a straight line. So as long as light is traveling within one consistent material, like if the light starts in glass and just continues through glass, you can assume it travels in a straight line, which means you can use principles from geometry like let's say you've got a prism shaped like this, just a rectangle, and you've got light traveling from here to here. And let's say you know this angle, 
and you want to find this angle. If you know this angle, how would you figure out this angle? Um, sine or like trig? Uh, trigonometry would be useful figure for figuring out side lengths. But if we just know some angles, like let's say you know this angle happens to be maybe 50 degrees and this is a right angle. Oh, um, the total up to 180. Yeah, if you, can, if you can establish a triangle, any triangle, you know the angles in that triangle have to add up to 180. And yeah, if you know that one of them is already 90 degrees, you can just deduct 90 and say the other two angles have to add up to 90. So triangles can be very useful here. As long as you're, if, you're, if you've got some straight line, look for triangles that it forms, or if it doesn't seem to form any obvious triangles, try extending it in both directions and see if you can create some triangles. So triangle angle sums adding up to 180 is a very useful tool you can use. And another very useful tool is parallel lines. Anytime you've got a geometrical situation where you've got two lines that are known to be parallel, for instance, maybe they're both horizontal or both vertical, and you've got maybe a ray of light passing through one of them, and maybe it gets to the other, or maybe it doesn't even get to the other, but you can extend the straight line geometrically. In that case, there are certain pairs of angles we know have to be the same. For instance, the alternate interior angles alternate sides, but interior to the parallel lines, and the alternate exterior angles outside the parallel lines, and the corresponding angles, these angles, these four angles all have to be the same. And separately, these four angles would all have to be the same as each other. So generally, anytime you've got two or more parallel lines and another line crossing through them, or that can be extended to cross through them, then there are certain, com certain categories of angles that you know have to be congruent. So look for situations like that. Anytime you've got a bunch of straight lines and you're trying to figure out some missing angles, try extending the lines you've already got and see if you can establish triangles so the angles have to add up to 180, or establish uh, lines crossing parallels so you know that certain angles match up. Or if you even know that you've got a right angle and a, another line that crosses through it, these two angles have to add up to 90. So extend lines further if you need to. Look for geometric facts that allow you to establish angles being the same or angles adding up to a certain value so you can solve for missing angles. And usually the reason you want to do that is to figure out at what angle does that ray of light hit the next surface so that you can use that in Snell's law. Any other questions on the refraction or geometry so far? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, um, so for like the n sine theta one, so the, the theta that we plug in is the angle that it's traveling at when it, when it enters that medium? Yeah, um, before it hits the surface. So that would be the angle that the incoming incident ray makes with the normal line. And then theta two would be the angle it makes on its way up out. Although it's interchangeable. If you swap the order here, it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. The important thing is n times sine theta on one side of the surface has to equal the other n times sine of the other theta on the other side of the surface. Okay, thank you. So that, that quantity n times sine theta is the same on both sides of the surface. Even though each number n and theta are changing, they're changing in this consistent way. So n sine theta stays constant. It's almost like a conservation law in some ways that the value of n sine theta before the, the surface has to equal the value of n sine theta after the surface. Any other questions on that so far? Um, Casey, I have a quick question um, about total internal reflection. Mm -hmm. um, we have an example in our FNT where it was going from, um, it was like talking about like a core um, with like glass on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so he did the, um, the fast medium times sine of 90. Wouldn't it... Um, like, why would the fast medium be the one with the sine of 90? Because isn't um, 
sorry, I don't know how to phrase this, but would it go from the slow to the fast medium? I thought that's like what we do for total internal reflection. Yeah, because in this case, like here we're going from fast to slow. If you go from mm -hmm. fast to slow, the angle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. We're never mm -hmm. getting total internal, internal reflection there. Total internal reflection means there is no refraction. But if your incoming angle gets smaller, it's always possible for an angle to get smaller. Whatever this angle is, it can always get closer to zero. So this sort of situation, going from fast to slow, is always going to allow refraction. You're never going to get only reflection. But if we're going the other way, if we're going from slow to fast, let's say we reverse this. Let's say we send an incident ray from underwater up towards the air. So we've got a ray from underwater coming up towards the air. And it makes some angle theta one. When we go from water to air, we're going from slow to fast. So what's going to happen to the angle? Um, it's going to bend away from the normal. Yeah, because an increase in speed means an increase in the angle. So instead of continuing along the same straight line, the ray of light is going to bend to make this angle larger. So it's going to bend like this. The refracted ray is going to bend to make that angle larger. So theta two is going to be larger than theta one. And if we look at the extreme here, like let's say you bend the ray, you, you change the ray of light, you make the incident ray come in at a larger angle. So theta one is even larger. That means theta two is going to get even larger still. But we run into some problems at some point. What's the largest value theta two could possibly be? Um, 90. Yeah, if you increase theta one sufficiently that theta two becomes 90, then that's a problem. Theta two being 90 means the, the light isn't really leaving the material. Theta two has got to be less than 90. If theta two is 90, it's not really leaving. It would just be skimming along the surface. So that would mean if theta two becomes 90, that means the light isn't really leaving. There is no refracted ray. Instead, where does the light go? Um, isn't it all being reflected? Right, it all gets reflected. There is no refraction. So if theta one is large enough to make theta two 90, or if theta one is even larger than that, then that means there is no reflection. Sorry, there is no refraction. There's only reflection. So this is what we call total internal reflection. If theta one is big enough that theta two becomes 90 or worse, then we get only reflection, no refraction at all. So if theta one is exactly large enough, if we're looking at the boundary line, exactly large enough to make theta two equals 90, we call theta one the critical angle. usually written as theta sub c. So as long as theta, as theta one is that angle or larger, you only get reflection, no refraction at all. So this is what we call total internal reflection. In the sense, internal in the sense that it all reflects back into the material it came from, none of it gets through. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you know which line to make your normal line? 
the normal line is always going to be perpendicular to the surface and always at the location where the incident hits the surface. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Because normal is just a mathematical term meaning perpendicular. So you could draw in a normal line at any location on the surface, but the only one we really care about is the one at the location where the incident ray actually hits. Okay, thank you. And that's really just a, a baseline for measuring angles. It's essentially just how we're defining our coordinate system. Any other questions on that so far? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so um, does the critical angle ever change or is it just only one possibility? It turns out it's only dependent on the materials that are involved here. Uh, so the critical angle, there's going to be a specific critical angle for water and air. There would be a different, a different critical angle for glass and air and a different critical angle for glass and water. The critical angle depends only on the combination of the materials being involved here. Because if we go back to Snell's law, N1 sine theta 1, equals N2 sine theta 2. We're plugging in N values for the two materials. We're assuming that theta 2 is exactly 90 because we want to figure out what's the break point. At what point does it just barely become total internal reflection? So we're plugging in 90 for theta 2. We're plugging in known values for N1 and N2. Theta 1 would be the only value left. So theta 1 is going to depend only on the indices of refraction of the two materials. In fact, if we actually try that, we're going to set theta 1 equal to the critical angle and set theta 2 equal to 90 degrees. If we actually fill that in, so we got N1, that is N in the material it starts in, times sine of the critical angle equals N2, N for the material it is going towards but never actually reaches times sine of 90 degrees. And what's sine of 90 degrees? One. Yeah, so we can just write one there. That's convenient, because now what else do we need to do to solve for theta critical? Um, divide N2 by N1 and then take the arc sine. Yeah, divide by N1, take the arc sine and inverse sine. Inverse sine, sorry. Yeah, they both mean the same thing. Arc sine is just another term for inverse sine. <clears throat> and that gives you a, essentially a formula for the critical angle. The critical angle depends only on the ratio of n values. So if you know both n values of both materials, the starting n value, n1, the material it starts in, and then n2 would be the material it's approaching on the other side of the surface. The inverse sine of that ratio tells you an angle if the incoming ray of light is that angle or larger, then you get only reflection, total internal reflection. None of the light gets through. If the angle is smaller, then it does get through and you get that split beam effect. Any questions on that so far? Uh, Casey, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, um, will air be always like the smallest index of refraction we'll see? Uh, yes, unless you're talking about pure vacuum. Okay. Uh -huh. Empty space. That would be n equals exactly one. Mm -hmm. If you air, n is very slightly larger than one, but we usually round that off to zero. Okay. And then my second question is: for <laughs> n two over n one, is n two always going to be smaller than n one for critical angles? Because mm -hmm. we're kind of assuming that um, n one is like the higher to the lower. Yeah, because if you try it the other way around, if you try a situation where N2 is larger and N1 is smaller, what do you get if you divide a larger number by a smaller number? Greater than one? Right, and you can't take the inverse sine of a ratio greater than one. Okay, okay. So N2 will always be less than N1 when we're trying to find the critical angle, right? If N2 okay. is larger than N1, that is if the second material is fast, or sorry, if the second material is slow and the starting material is fast, then this doesn't work. There is no critical angle and you'll never get total internal reflection. Okay, thank you. So yeah, the restriction is in order to get total internal reflection at all, in order for that to even be a possibility, you've got to be going from a slow medium to a fast medium, from a small end value to a, sorry, from a large end value to a small end value, slow to fast. Okay. And what so, does the critical angle tell us? Uh, the critical angle tells us the, the breaking point where we just barely get total internal reflection. 
So if you imagine you've got a ray of light coming in at a close angle, that should get through. But if you gradually make the angle larger and larger and larger, theta two will also get larger and larger, even more so. At some point, when you reach what we call the critical angle, theta two becomes exactly 90 and the ray just sort of vanishes into the surface. There is no more reflection. So as soon as theta one becomes that critical angle, you no longer have refraction. And theta one being even larger, you still have no, refle no refraction, only reflection. So it's really critical in the sense of the boundary point, the transition from one state to another. Uh, so total internal reflection means that no light gets through and it's only reflected. Exactly. All of it bounces back into the same medium. None of it gets through into the other medium. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we want to happen in cases like that, uh, that fiber optics cable. The idea is you want, uh, the fiber optics cable is basically a solid cylinder of light, or so, sorry, solid cylinder of glass. And we want to be able to send light through it so that the light gets to the other end. So you can use it for sending signals and stuff like that. But the idea is even if there's a bend in the tube, we still want the light to get through. And the convenient way to make light bend is to set up different materials. So the inside and outside, the, the inner core and the outer coating or cladding are made of different materials. You want to set it up so that when the light is trying to leave the core and go into the surroundings, the cladding, you want it to reflect off. You want only total internal reflection. So to get total internal reflection, should you be going from fast to slow or from slow to fast? In this case, when we got total internal reflection, were we going from slow to fast or fast to slow? Slow to fast? Yeah. You've got to be starting in a slow light material and going towards a fast light material. So if you want total internal reflection, you should set it up in such a way that the light starts off in the slow light material, a large end value, and is approaching a fast light material with a smaller end value. So that's how you can guarantee that total internal reflection is at least possible. Any other questions on that? And uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so it only happens when we're going from uh, slow to fast. So yeah. from fast to slow, isn't there like also a way to, because it, isn't it that if you hit the surface at 90 degrees, then you're gonna, it's, oh, never mind. I think if you hit it at 90 degrees, it's gonna go through, right? Yeah, well, the thing is theta one cannot be 90 degrees. You can't send in light that's 90 degrees to the, the normal line. Because light that's 90 degrees to the normal line would be parallel to the surface, which means it wouldn't be going into the surface. It would just be skimming along the surface. So theta one must be less than 90 degrees or you're not really sending light towards the surface. And if you're going from fast to slow, the angle's gonna shrink. So if theta one's less than 90 degrees, theta two would be even smaller than that. So you're never gonna run into the problem of theta two becoming 90 degrees. You only get that if you're going from slow to fast. Okay. And then if you had the incident ray coming in like, um, I meant like like perpendicular to the, the um, surface of the air. If it's just coming in like this? Yeah, then it would just all go through, right? Yeah, it'll just go straight through. Because if the, if the incident ray is coming in along the normal line, theta one is zero, which means theta two will also be zero because sine of zero is zero. So that's the, the one time, basically the one situation where the ray of light doesn't bend at all. If it's coming in along the normal line, it'll just continue straight through without any bending. Just continue. Okay. And then what were you saying about if it were coming in along the line? Uh, if it's coming in along the normal line, it just goes straight through. But if the incident ray is parallel to the surface, it's not really going to the surface. It's just skimming along the surface. So that wouldn't really be refraction at all. Okay. Thank it's got to come in at some angle and hit the surface in order for this to happen. <coughs> Any other questions on that? All right, then let's try out some lenses and see, <coughs> see how this applies to those. Lenses are based on ref refraction, light getting through and bending, in much the same way that mirrors are based on reflection, light bouncing off. If you've got a lens, 
specifically, let's say a lens shaped like this, a convex lens, convex in the sense that it's bulging out. We could have rays of light coming in. And if the rays of light comes in along the optical axis, then it's hitting the surface at a right angle. So what's going to happen to that ray of light? If it's coming in, it'll just reflect it, right back. What was that? It'll just reflect right back. If it was a mirror, it would reflect right back. But as a lens, we're assuming it's allowed to go through. So it's going to go through in what sort of direction? Straight. Yeah, it's just going to continue straight because it's hitting the surface at a right angle. Then it continues in. It hits this surface at a right angle also, so it just continues straight through. No bending at all. If we have another another ray of light, let's say parallel to that axis but higher up, now we'd have to draw in a normal line at this point. So if we draw in a normal line, a line perpendicular to the surface. this ray of light makes an angle with that normal line. And let's say we're assuming that this is a lens made of glass, a slow light material. Let's say we're going from air to glass to air again. So we're going from fast to slow. What should we expect to happen to the, uh, to the angle? If it's making some angle with the normal line, it can't just keep going straight because that would make the same angle. Instead, what should we expect to happen to the angle? Is there refraction? There is going to be refraction. And we've got to figure out how the angle changes. If we okay. take air to glass, what happens to the speed of the light? It decreases. Right. From air to glass, the speed has decreased. And we should expect the angle to do the same thing. If the speed has decreased, then the angle will also decrease. So this ray of light is going to bend towards the normal line, making the angle get smaller. <clears throat> so we're going to get a bend towards the normal line, making the angle smaller in accordance with Snell's law. Then that ray of light continues straight within the glass and hits this other side. So we would draw in another normal line at this side, perpendicular to the surface. Ray of light is now making this angle with the new normal line. And instead of going straight, it's going to bend again. We're now going from glass to air. That's from slow to fast. So what should we expect to happen to the angle? The angle increases this time. Right. Slow to fast, the speed is increasing. So we need to make this ray of light bend to make the angle increase. So the ray of light bends away from the normal line, the new normal line, to make the angle larger. And note that this means that these rays that were parallel, never meeting, are now bending so they do meet. And for this region, we call this a converging lens. <clears throat> the converging lens in terms of what it's doing to light. It's taking these rays of light that were originally parallel and bending them so that they converge. They come together and meet. And note that this is the opposite of mirrors. For mirrors, a concave mirror was converging the light. For lenses, the convex mirror or convex lens is converging the light. And this will be true for any ray of light we send in that's parallel. We send in a, another ray of light that's parallel. It's going to bend towards the normal line and then bend away from the new normal line. And it turns out to meet the other ones in the exact same location. <clears throat> in fact, any ray of light you send in that's parallel to that optical axis is going to bend in this very predictable way. All these rays of light that start parallel are going to bend so that they intersect in this one point. And what do we call that one point? Focal point? Yeah, this is the focal point or focus. So that's the main pattern involved in converging lenses, a convex lens or a converging lens. Any ray of light that starts off parallel to the central axis is going to bend towards this one focal point on the opposite side. And this is reversible. 
any ray of light that starts off going through the focus is going to hit the lens and bend to become parallel. This makes this very useful for things like flashlights and searchlights. If you have like a, a small light bulb that's emitting light in all directions, but you want the light to all be going in the same direction so you get this tightly focused beam, you put in a converging lens uh, arranged so that the light bulb is exactly at the focus. That way light coming from the focus hits the lens and just travels all together in the unified parallel direction. So this makes it so the light is no longer spreading out and getting more diffuse. It's all going in this one direction. So you just get one small bright patch on the wall far away. And this also works in the other direction. If you've got a bunch of rays of light coming in parallel, like for instance, rays of sunlight, you can use this converging lens to make all those come together and any object at the focal point is going to get really hot because you've got all this light coming in and being concentrated on one spot. So it's like you're taking all the energy that would be hitting this entire large surface and making it hit a much smaller point instead. So that one point is going to get hot very quickly. You can use this to uh, start a small fire, for instance, if you need to set something on fire, you don't have any matches, but as long as you've got sunlight and a convex lens, you can just hold this up to the sunlight, put your kindling or whatever at the focal point and the rays of sunlight concentrate on that one spot and heat it up possibly enough to set it on fire. Any questions on that so far? I have a question. So um, uh, for um, uh, mirrors, I remember that like the place that like all the rays intersected we called that the image. So why are we calling it the focus point? The difference is the, the image is the location where all the rays of light from the object end up coming together. The focus is the point where all of the parallel rays end up coming together. And this is true for a mirror as well. If you've got a, a concave mirror, which is also going to be called converging. If you've got these rays of light coming in parallel, these rays are going to bounce off in a certain way. And all those parallel rays and all these rays coming in parallel hit the mirror and bounce off towards and through this one point. So this point would be called the focus of the mirror. Same thing here. Um, in both so cases, the focus is where all of the originally parallel rays bend or reflect towards. Um, so for um, lenses, um, uh, is the focal point still like halfway between the, the lens and like uh, not for mirrors. For mirrors, it's a little more for lenses. I mean, for mirrors, it is. For mirrors, the focus point is always just halfway between the surface and the center of the sphere that it's part of. For lenses, it's more complicated. For the lens, it depends on the curvature radius, the other curvature radius, and also the material it's made from. You can have two lenses that are exactly the same shape, but different materials, and they're going to have different focal points. So for lenses, it depends on the shape of the lens, the radius of curvature, and also the material it's made of, and also even the material it's surrounded by. If you take this lens and measure its focal length in air, then you take the same lens and put it under water and measure the focal length, you'll get a different value. So focal point depends on the curvature of the both sides of the lens and the material it's made of and the material it's surrounded by, specifically the index of refraction of each material. Uh, there's an equation called for that called the lens makers equation. If you want to look that up, lens makers equation is basically a way of calculating the focal distance based on the curvature of the lens lens surfaces and the material it's made of and the material it's surrounded by. We're not going to get into the details of that in this class. We're basically just going to treat the focal length as a known property of the mirror or known property of the lens. But it's really the only property you need to know. If you know the focal length of a mirror or lens or mirror, either one, you immediately know everything you need to know about it. Any questions on that so far? Uh, can I, is it okay if I can just repeat some stuff you said? So 
yeah, yeah, yeah. The converging lens that could that's basically a com um a convex lens but it could also be kind of like a concave mirror is that kind of like there's uh, yeah the convex lens acts like the concave mirror and for okay. this one, i find it useful to describe both of these not in terms of the shape but in terms of what they do this right. is a converging lens this is a converging mirror because they're both okay. doing the same sort of thing to the light okay and then diverging lens would be like the opposite so it'll be diverging lens is the same as like concave lens basically but which is also like convex mirrors maybe a concave lens and a convex mirror these both cause light to diverge okay in parallel rays of light to the convex mirror they're going to bounce off mm -hmm. They started off parallel, they end up spreading out. Right. Of course, okay. the concave lens, you send in parallel rays of light. The one that hits the middle just goes straight through. Mm -hmm. The other ones are going to end up spreading out. Okay. If you try the actual ray tracing there. Okay, thank Both you. The concave lens and the convex mirror are doing the same sort of thing to light. Likewise, mm -hmm. the convex lens and the concave mirror are both causing the light to converge. Okay, and for diverging lens, would it still only make a virtual image? Is that uh, yeah? The diverging lens is only going to be able to make a virtual image because if you've got these rays of light that are already from the object that are already spreading out, a diverging lens makes them spread out even more, so they're never going to meet. You'd have to backtrace. Okay. Okay. So Thanks. for they, they they do the lenses and mirrors do follow that same pattern. If you've got a diverging lens or a diverging mirror, that can only produce a virtual image. If you've got a converging lens or a converging mirror, those could produce a real image or a virtual image depending on where the object is in relation to the focal point. Mm -hmm. One important difference though is that since uh, for like for the mirror, light's always on one side. So you've just got one focal point. For the lens though, you could be sending in light this way for, and let's say it starts parallel, they all bend towards this point. Or you could send rays of light in this way and they're all going to bend towards one point on this side. So that would be another focal point over here. So each lens has two focal points, one on each side, but they should be equidistant. If we're assuming that the shape of the lens is symmetric, then the focal point should be the same distance on both sides. So there's just one focal length, but it shows up on both sides of the lens. Any questions on that so far? I have another quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I always get confused with drawing the normal line. I was wondering, like, for example, the first, very first line that you drew, like, how did you know to slope the normal line downwards and not upwards? Let's draw a close up of that so we can look at what's going on there. We had, like, if we look at just this section, we've got the lens surface like this and also like this over here. So if these are the surfaces, and let's say we've got this ray of light coming in parallel. Parallel to the axis. At this point, we want to draw in a normal line. Normal line in the sense of perpendicular to the surface. And for curves, drawing in a normal line can sometimes be kind of difficult. What I find is sometimes useful is to use a straight edge to draw in a tangent line first, just lightly draw in a tangent line. Sometimes it's easier to draw in a perpendicular to a straight line. So drawing a tangent line if it helps and then rotate your ruler exactly 90 degrees and draw in a tangent uh, normal line. So that's our normal line, a line perpendicular to the surface itself. And note that this makes an angle with the incoming ray. So that would be theta one. And if we imagine continuing this ray of light 
if there was no refraction, if this was just the same material, air, 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 this would just continue in a straight line and make the same angle. But it's not the same medium. We're going from air to glass to air. So we're assuming we're going from slow to fast. Sorry, other way around. From fast to slow to fast again. We're going from slow to fast. So what's going to happen to the ray of light? What happens to the angle? It would Sorry, increase. Fast to slow. Yep. Fast to slow, it would decrease. Yeah. So we should assume that this angle gets smaller. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's only this way. Meaning the ray of light is going to bend. Instead of going in a straight line, it's going to bend to make the angle smaller. So it's going to mm -hmm. bend a little bit towards the normal line. And it's now going in this direction. And it just continues in a straight line as long as it's within that one material. Then it hits the other surface. So we'll have to draw in a new normal line. And again, it can be helpful to draw in a tangent line first and then rotate your ruler 90 degrees to draw in a normal line at that point. Mm -hmm. So there's a new normal line. And if we take a look at this angle, let's call that theta three. This would have been theta two. And again, if there was no change, we would just assume this continues in a straight line and makes another copy of the same angle. But it doesn't go in a straight line. If we're going from slow to fast, what should we expect to happen to the angle? It should um, increase. Yeah, the speed is increasing. So the angle is also going to increase. We're gonna get a larger angle which means the ray of light bends. Instead of continuing in a straight line making the same angle, it's gonna bend outwards away from the normal line to make the angle larger. So something like that. So it bends towards the normal line and then it bends away from the new normal line and heads on towards what the point that we'll, we'll call the focus. Okay, yeah, the tangent thing really helps. Yeah, it's a very useful way of drawing it out. If you draw the tangent line, because I mean, we're, I think we're used to visually dealing with straight lines and then dealing with curves. So if you draw a tangent line that acts like the curve on a very local basis, and it's easier to see what's going on. So always be ready to draw in a tangent line to a curve if that helps you make more sense of it. Any other questions on that? So as a general rule, any ray of light, for, for a converging lens anyway, a convex lens is gonna cause light to converge. Any ray of light that starts parallel is gonna to bend towards that focal point on the other side. But that also goes in reverse. Any ray of light coming from the focal point hits the lens and bends to become parallel. So those are two rays you can always draw in. Any ray, any ray coming from the object, if it starts off parallel, it bends towards the far focal point. If it starts off going through the near focal point, it bends to become parallel after it hits the lens. And also, of course, any ray of light going straight towards the exact center of the lens just keeps going in a straight line. So you can always draw in those three rays when you're working out ray tracing in a converging lens. Uh, so we'll look into some more examples of that next time. In the meantime, uh, don't forget to vote today if you haven't already. And I will see you next time. Thank you. You're welcome.